In the last lecture module, we introduced Quine, and we talked about the development of the project of axiomatization in mathematics. In this module, we're going to look at logical empiricism, and we'll see how the logical empiricists looked at, on the one hand, the developments of mathematics, and on the other hand, the astounding progress that was being made in science, and decided to try and synthesize these into a coherent understanding of science and its epistemic grounds. This involved a conceptual studies project and a doctrinal studies project as well. Their ultimate view of science was that of a nested hierarchy of axiom systems, so that there'd be an axiom system for chemistry and an axiom system for thermodynamics and an axiom system for biology and so on. All of these axiom systems will be related to each other via the fact that their theoretical terms could be semantically reduced to the next lower down and lower down and lower down until ultimately all of science could be semantically reduced to observation language that was tied very strongly to the certainty of immediate experience. We'll look at Quine's criticisms of both these projects his criticisms of conceptual studies and of doctrinal studies, and then we'll talk about the underlying motivations he has for introducing his own project through these vehicles. In this section of the lecture, just as in the previous one, there'll be a lot of talk about fairly technical developments, both in mathematics and now in physics. Don't be freaked out or scared by that. All that I'm trying to do is to give you a sense of the intellectual milieu to help you to understand how dynamic and interesting this time was, how it motivated these people to think about their projects in the way that it did. Focus on the role of conceptual studies and doctrinal studies in the two projects that we look at, and you'll be okay. All the rest of it is topping on top of the ice cream cone. When we consider the tremendous developments in logic and mathematics during that very short period of time, at the beginning of the 20th, end of the 19th century, they seem amazing and impressive, but they are dwarfed by the dramatic changes that occur in science at this time. The productive confluence of categorization, operationalization, and experiment at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century witnesses a rise in a newly robust science in many fields. Physics and chemistry in particular witness a number of dramatic advances that tear apart the old orthodoxy. I'd say within approximately 60 years, from maybe 1870 to 1930, the groundwork for atomic physics, atomic chemistry, quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, and space-time physics, they all fall into place in that one small period of time. So, for example, Maxwell published works on thermodynamics in 1871. In 1872, and then in 1877, the Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann publishes his Boltzmann equation and his H theorem. Boltzmann claims that the H theorem proves the second law of thermodynamics, while his Boltzmann equation describes the statistical behavior of a thermodynamic system when not in a state of equilibrium. In 1894, William Ramsey and Lord Raleigh publish Argon, a new constituent of the atmosphere. Now, this marks the beginning of the discovery of noble gases and ultimately of an expansion of the periodic table. In 1897, J.J. Thompson publishes Cathode Rays, in which he essentially discovers electrons. In 1901, Max Planck publishes On the Law of the Distribution of Energy in the Normal Spectrum. In the paper, he introduces Planck's law to calculate the electromagnetic radiation emitted by a black body in thermal equilibrium at a given temperature. Planck's paper introduces the idea of quantum theory to physics. In 1905, Einstein has what they describe as his miracle year. He publishes four famous and foundational papers. On a heuristic viewpoint concerning the production and transformation of light, adapts Planck's work on black body radiation to explain the photoelectric effect, and that's actually what won him the Nobel Prize. Investigations on the theory of Brownian movement describes the motion of pollen molecules in a liquid using statistical mechanics. And importantly, Einstein demonstrates the existence of atoms, the reality of which were debated by showing how one can count them using an ordinary microscope. These two papers taken together lay the groundwork for the coming atomic physics and quantum mechanics. In the paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies, Einstein introduces what we now know as the special theory of relativity. More specifically, Einstein reconciles Maxwell's work in electromagnetism 
with classical mechanics by introducing the principle of relativity and the principle of the invariance of the speed of light. Finally, in Does the Inertia of a Body Depend Upon Its Energy Content, Einstein deduces his famous E equals mc squared equation forever changing the way we understand the relationship between matter and energy. Einstein's former mathematics professor Hermann Minkowski publishes Space and Time in 1908, in which Minkowski provides a space-time geometry to subserve Einstein's special relativity. In 1911, Ernest Rutherford publishes The Scattering of Alpha and Beta Particles by Matter and the Structure of the Atom, formulating the first significant theory of the structure of the atom. In 1913, Niels Bohr publishes On the Constitution of Atoms and Molecules, Parts 1, 2, and 3, in which he modifies Rutherford's account within the framework of quantum mechanics. The resulting theory of atomic structure goes under several names, the Solar System Model, the Bohr-Rutherford Model, or the Bohr Model, but it represents the first really good model of the structure of the atom. In 1916, Einstein publishes The Foundation of the General Theory of Relativity, outlining the theory of general relativity and completing the reconceptualization of gravitational physics. In 1919, Arthur Eddington travels to the African island of Principe and provides photographic evidence to support general relativity. Specifically, he photographs light bending around the sun during an eclipse on May 29th in 1919. 1925 sees Wolfgang Pauli publish On the Connection Between the Completion of Electron Groups in an Atom with the Complex Structure of Spectra, in which he formulates the electron version of the Pauli exclusion principle. Pauli's principle allows one to draw the properties of electron shells, both orbits and the number of possible electrons in each orbit, by demonstrating that no two electrons orbiting in a single nucleus can have the same quantum state. Erwin Schrödinger publishes An Undulatory Theory of the Mechanics of Atomic Molecules in 1926, in which his Schrödinger equation provides the mathematical framework for the wave model of atomic structure. Werner Heisenberg publishes Quantum Theoretical Reinterpretation of Kinematic and Mechanical Relations, wherein he states the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Heisenberg's Uncertainty Principle states that the precision with which one can determine the position of a particle varies inversely with the precision with which one can determine its momentum. Thus, the period beginning in 1871 with Maxwell's book on heat and ending in 1927 with Heisenberg's paper on uncertainty leads to the fundamental reformulation of thermodynamics, chemistry, space-time physics, as well as the birth of atomic physics and quantum mechanics. Theoretical models move from exceptionalist, universal, and deterministic laws towards statistical, probabilistic, and relativistic models. It's during this time that the American physicist Percy Williams Bridge forwards the doctrine of operationalizationism or operationism in his 1927 book The Logic of Modern Physics. The book and its author intend the doctrine for physicists primarily. Bridgman himself was inspired by general relativity as well as his own prowess as an experimental physicist. He identifies theoretical concepts with a single unique procedure for their measurement. The doctrine remains somewhat ambiguous regarding its status as a theory of meaning, though it naturally lends itself to such an interpretation. And Bridgman interacts with two prominent early logical positivists, Otto Neurath and Moore Schlick regarding his theory. Bridgman's work, together with Einstein's, strongly influenced the development of philosophical thinking beginning in the 20s and the 30s. In the next lecture module, we'll see how the logical empiricists, inspired by the developments in mathematics and the developments in the sciences, seek to combine the insights of these two fields into a thoroughgoing, systematic philosophy of science.